All right, I am starting the recording. Today is April 20th. Uh, basically today, we're gonna talk about uh, multiples. <clears throat> so in just a minute, I had put up, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. An announcement, <clears throat> which links to Uh, the files we're going to use today, both Lecture Note 6, as well as the multiples assignment template. Okay, so we need both of those files for today's session. Okay. And essentially, uh, what we're getting into is on Wednesday, uh, by 10 a.m., homework 8 will be due, <clears throat> which is a multiples assignment on Starbucks, Yum, and McDonald's. So again, it's gonna be similar to the process that we're gonna cover in class today. So you'll need to, to basically kind of pay attention, follow the process, the, the Bloomberg data screenshots are already there, and uh, you'll be uh, finishing that homework uh, for Wednesday, 10 a.m., which we'll discuss in Wednesday's class. So <clears throat> let's talk about multiples. Right? So again, let's go back here, and I will pull up lecture note six. So multiples, also known as comparables or comparables, are just another form of valuation. So in our third section of valuation, we, fo we focused on sort of enterprise DCF. And now we're gonna use multiples or comparables to value a company. And what's important to understand is, even though we're changing our approach and methodology, using multiples or comparables to value a company, we should still get the same price of a company. Like the value of the company doesn't change just because we're changing our methodology. Matter of fact, that's the point. We're going to get to the same answer. And so what we're going to quickly realize is that multiples are just a rearranged academic equation. So what they do is they look at, you know, similar types of assets. They look at the prices and they basically try and infer pricing based on similarity. Okay? So in your personal lives, the most common multiple that you'd probably uh, ever run into is if you ever buy a house. Okay, because what they're going to do when they appraise the house is they're going to say, okay, let's look at other houses that have sold in the neighborhood or near your neighborhood recently. And then they're going to take the prices that those houses were sold and divide by the square foot of the house to get a price per square foot. Okay, and they're going to average the price per square foot for the area. And then what that's going to do is it's going to help the appraisal for your house because the appraiser will say, okay, if this is the price per square foot in the area, then your house times that price, your house's square feet times that price is the value of the house, okay? And in a way, that's just a multiple. Now that's a starting point because obviously you're assuming all houses are the same and there could be some reasons for some variation in price per square foot. So for example, lot size, age, condition of house, location, and et cetera. So they'll make some adjustments, but the general idea is I use <coughs> prices in the real world to help me do a proxy for what the values of similar assets are going to be. That's a multiple analysis. The good news for multiples <clears throat> is that they're very easy, right? The bad news for multiples is that they're very easy. And so one of the biggest challenges with multiples is actually finding similar companies. It's not as easy as you think it is. So for example, if I'm valuing an internet startup, I can't say Facebook is always gonna be my peer. They're a completely different lifestyle, life cycle stages of the company. So therefore, Facebook is not a proxy for an, an internet startup today, right? But some people will do that. They'll use that as the proxy. So we gotta be very, very careful about what is a multiple, what is a comparable, right? Ideally, you want companies in the same industry and that have similar growth rates, ROIC, and capital structures. That would be ideal, right? But nonetheless, <clears throat> the process that you're gonna go through we're going to talk about today is you find, and this is the hardest part, is assembling the multiples, similar companies, right? Then getting the data from a data service, we're going to use Bloomberg, and then basically calculating the data to help you do the multiple analysis. That's the process that we're going to go through in class today, right? So, in the interest of time, I can also mention that multiples are used for something else called precedent transactions. So, it's not just for valuation. Uh, if you're doing an M&A, if you're doing an IPO, if you want to value a private company, um, you can also look at sale prices in other deals 
as a way to help value things. So multiples can be used not just for valuation of publicly traded companies, they can be used for lots of different things. <clears throat> so generally there are six types of multiples that we would normally cover. In this shortened version of the class, we're gonna focus on three, right? And the three multiples we're gonna focus on are the price to earnings or PE multiple, the EV to sales or enterprise value to sales, and the enterprise value to EBIT, okay? Those will be the three core multiples that we're gonna go over. So, <clears throat> how does this work? How does a multiple work? Well, let's go back and understand key value drivers. So, the key value driver equation, which is basically this equation that we've been using since the beginning of the semester, okay? Actually, it's not that equation, it's this equation, okay? <clears throat> Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that equation, no plat times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. I'm gonna start with $100 no plat and a 10% WAC. And then I'm just gonna create a table based on these growth rates and these ROICs, okay? So that should be the results if I ran it through the key value driver equation. So for example, I have $100 no plat, 10% WAC, 10% ROIC, doesn't matter what the G is because it is zero spread. <clears throat> I don't create any value. This is the treadmill. This is the NPV zero projects. Okay. Just kind of the math played out. Again, if my spread's negative, <clears throat> ROIC less than WAC, I would be destroying value. I would basically, the more I grew the negative spread, the more value I would destroy. This is positive value. Again, the more I grew a positive spread, the more value I would create. And this is the table playing out the formulas. So what I'm gonna do on the next slide <clears throat> is instead of doing key value drivers with <clears throat> no plat, we're gonna do an equity cash flow. <clears throat> so basically we're gonna replace the key value driver equation, no plat with net income. <clears throat> and we're gonna replace the growth in the no plat, the growth in the free cash flow, with the growth in the net income. <clears throat> and instead of dividing by the ROIC, we're going to divide by the ROE, the return of the equity. And instead of discounting by the WAC minus the G, we're going to discount by the cost of equity minus the growth in the net income. That's the same key value driver equation, except the difference is we're going to plug in equity cash flows. And by doing that, instead of getting the market value of the company, oh, sorry, the uh, enterprise value of the company, we get the market value of the equity. Okay, so that's basically what this formula does. So again, a lot of data in this next slide, but here's the point. If I take the same key value driver equation and I run the math through the table, $100 of income, 10% cost of equity, I get these results. So again, at a 10% ROE, 10% cost of equity, doesn't matter what the growth is, value doesn't change. Negative spread, positive spread, different growth rates. Second part of the table says, okay, I'm gonna take these values, I'm gonna divide by my income. Price, value, divided by earnings, income, is the PE ratio. So it's just this divided by the 100, okay? So basically, a company with a 10% ROE, given a cost of equity of 10% zero spread, would trade at 10 times earnings, regardless of the growth rate. Because again, it doesn't matter what the growth is, it is zero spread. A company that had a negative spread would trade at a multiple less than 10, and a company that has a positive spread would trade at a multiple higher than 10. Okay, so let's play this out. Let's say a company was trading at, make up a number, eight times earnings in this industry. Right, they assume they had a 10% cost of capital, 10% cost of equity. Well, where do I see my eights? Well, eight would probably be somewhere in here, somewhere in here. So I could almost draw a line of where my eights would be. So I can't say exactly what the growth and ROE would be. I have a general idea of what the potential range is. And that entire range suggests positive growth at a negative spread. And therefore, I know that this company is trading at a discount because it has a negative spread. Let's say I take another company in this industry, whoever's... Uh, Yawning. <laughs> I know this can be kind of boring, but can you mute, mute yourself? Um, basically, if I have a multiple above 10, 
that means I am creating value, right? Positive spread. So let's just say my PE is, make up a number, 11, okay? So where do I see 11s on this table? Well, here, somewhere in here would be an 11. Somewhere in here would be 11. And somewhere here would be 11, okay? So again, I don't know the exact growth and spread, but I know it's gonna be somewhere in this range of growth and spreads that explains an 11 times multiple, right? And that's kind of what we're gonna do in multiples, is that multiples are just an expression of growth and spread. So by looking at the multiple and understanding the formulas, what growth and spread explain that multiple? Now, you can also translate a PE into a price to book, which we're not gonna really spend too much time on this semester, only because, and here's the point, a price to book of one means the value of the company equals the original investment, okay? The book value of the equity. And that's when you have a zero spread. Dollar's worth a dollar, okay? Negative spread, dollar of equity is worth less than a dollar. Positive spread, dollar of equity is worth more than a dollar, right? And that would make sense because price to book is just spread. It's actually the cleanest ratio to exp express the spread of a company. Just look at the price to book with the following caveat. <clears throat> accounting distorts the price to book because the book value of equity is based on accounting. And if companies have been buying back their stock at market value or there's been write-offs, it can distort the price to book multiple. So that's why for purposes of the semester, a little bit more advanced, we're not gonna talk as much about this ratio, but generally price to book is a pure representation of spread. Above one means creating a positive spread, below one negative spread, generally in theory. Okay, but focusing on PE, okay? Now, here's what I wanna do. I wanna go to the real world, right? So we're gonna take our spreadsheet and the spreadsheet that I gave you is called Multiple Analysis Template. So we need to grab that spreadsheet. make it a little bit bigger just so we can see all of the data. There we go. The first tab is called the PE. And I'm going to save this for section 201. <clears throat> so the three companies that we're going to look at are Costco, Walmart, and target. And what we're gonna do is we're going to basically use the key value driver equation here to create synthetic PEs. And we're gonna compare them against the actual PEs to make sure that we match the G process, which we followed today. So using Bloomberg, how do we do this? Well, for Costco, what we would do is we would go to Costco, US equity, we would go to the EEO screen, and we would start using the data from the screen. Now, just to be consistent with what I did in the 11 a.m. section today, because the price is changing through the day, I had taken some screenshots. So I'm gonna use the screenshot from earlier today for Costco for the EEO screen, just so we have the same data as the 11 a.m. section. So basically, the first piece of data I need is I need their net income, expected net income. So this is where we use forward data. So as the book talks about, this is actual, last year, estimate, so therefore forward year one, forward year two, we do annual data, forward year three, forward year four, that's the convention. You always count in Bloomberg, one column, forward year two, second column, forward year, th forward year one, forward year two. Now, <clears throat> the convention is to use the second forward year when we do multiples analysis. Here's why. Because companies worth some of its future cash flows, I want to use an estimate of what the future cash flows are to help figure out what those long-term future cash flows are going to be. The future is more representative than historical data. So I don't want to use the well, historical data, I want to use the future data. And I use the second forward year because this year is dirty. And what I mean by that 
Costco's first fiscal year ends August 2020, which means it's April 2020, almost May. So here's the point. 70% of the year is already done. So at this point, <clears throat> this has both months of actual data and months of forecasted data mixed. This second forward year is 12 months of pure forecast data. We generally think that this data is more normalized and more representative of the long-term future than this mixed data of past and present. Okay? So just convention, we're gonna use second forward year. So in this case, the second forward year net income forecast for Costco right now is 4,144 So 4,144, that's the number we're gonna type in for their Costco net expected net income. Now, I then need their return in equity. In Bloomberg, if I'm on the screen and I minimize it, there's actually more data down here. <laughs> Just minimize this middle section. All right. Now I'm going to take a screenshot. I'm going to save this screenshot as EEO2. Okay. And I'm just calling the first one EEO, which is this screen, and minimized EEO2, just the second version of the EEO with more screen. Now, down here, this part that was hidden, is a forecast for return on equity going forward for the Costco. In this case, next year, 23.7%, then 22%, then 19%, then 23.3%. So, what I'm going to do is I need a representative return on equity for my equation. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take, again, from the screenshot, so I use the same data as I did earlier today, these three numbers, and I'm going to average them. I'm going to say that three-year average is representative of the future. Okay, now if it's not, I need to come up with something that's representative, but we're going to start with a three-year average. So 23.7, rounding off, so equals 0.237 plus... Point two two percent, twenty two percent, point two two plus nineteen percent, point one nine. Now I take all of that divided by three, I get twenty one point five seven percent for three year average return on equity. All right. Now the nice thing about these companies is their future probably looks like it's not going to change too much. So this probably is representative of their longer term return on equity. Next, I'll need the cost of the equity. So again, I'll go to, if I were in Bloomberg, I would type WACC, and I'd get a whack, but I'd also get a cost of equity right here. Okay, so again, take a screenshot of the whack for Costco, 6.3% was the 11 a.m. section whack for equity. So that's what we're going to use. The cost of equity is 6.3%. And finally, at the time of the valuation off of the EEO screen, second forward year, one, two, PE, price to earnings, adjusted earnings, which again takes out one time items, is 33.53. So 33.53 was the actual PE. With no growth, it'd be 15.87. So obviously Costco is expected to grow. So just like we did in our valuation model, 3% growth, 4% growth, 3.9, 3.8, 35. There we go. So just like we did solving for the G in our valuation model, we know that somewhere around 3.85% is the G growth of net income that the market's using in perpetuity at this level of return on equity and cost of equity to explain this PE. Right? So this is the process that I'm now going to repeat two more times for Walmart and Target. Okay? So for Walmart, again, and I'm just gonna use the screenshots here because this is the way you're gonna do your assignment. I'll pull up the EEO for Walmart. 
And on this screen, I need my second forward year net income, forward year one, forward year two, net income 15147. I then need my, I'll just do the PE here, second forward year PE, I'm trying to solve for 24.16. In terms of the cost of equity for Walmart, their cost of equity today is 5%. And finally, their expected return on equity, if I grab it off of the EEO2 version of the screenshot with the whole screen there, three next year's return on equity, 18.7. Plus 19.5 plus 18.6 divided by three. It's about 19%. Little under. So Walmart's G is probably closer to 1%. One. There we go. And target, <clears throat> again, if I take <clears throat> screenshot here, target has a second forward year net income, one, two, 36, 34. PE is second forward year 15, one, seven. Their expected return on equity, if I do a three year average, 25.969, so call it 26. Plus 27.1. Right by three. And I forgot to put the PE. Their PE today, which what is the EEO, is 15.17 for second forward year. So what growth rate gets me there? 2%. Nope. Oh, sorry, wrong. Cost of equity. Copy, edit, paste special, do values. That's supposed to be 1517. Wait a minute. Hold on. I'm screwing up here. Try this again. 18. No, there's, sorry. Two, I'm closing all these screens. I got too many damn screens open. Back to this, target. Point two six equals two six plus two seven one plus. Two five two and for the cost of equity, six point nine. I got the other number in there. It's supposed to be six point nine. There we go. <clears throat> so one percent point eight. So six, zero four, zero zero, nine. There we go. <clears throat> All right. 
So I'll save this, so lose it again. Sorry for the screw up. But basically, just kind of putting the numbers in and solving for the Gs. <clears throat> this is what the data has to be today, given for G, the growth of net income, given the other data that we've seen. All right, I know I did that relatively quickly. This has been recorded on video. Questions about the data, where it came from, how I put it in, what numbers go where? Because this would be the first part of your assignment. All right, <clears throat> so next, analysis. So this is the 250 words of the 500 word write-up. <clears throat> so basically, what you need to do is explain why Costco is trading at a premium or discount to Walmart and Target, okay? Now a premium means the price is higher than the peer. A discount means the price is lower than a peer. So in this case, Costco is trading at a premium to both Walmart and Target. Using these multiples, why? Why is it trading at 33 and a half times earnings and Walmart trading at 24.2 times earnings, okay? That's what we need to explain. Now, representative, these are the key value drivers, which means multiples are an expression of growth and spread. So how do we explain with growth and spread <clears throat> the differences in the multiples? <clears throat> well, the first thing is <clears throat> Costco is growing at 3.85% versus Walmart's 1.1%, and Costco has a higher spread, 21.6 minus 6 is greater than 18.9 minus 5. So given that they have a slightly higher spread, about two points higher, let's call it, at a growth rate that is also 3.8 versus 1.1, that explains why Costco is trading at a premium, okay? But it's not the whole story. This growth at the same or slightly higher spread should actually give them an even higher multiple difference. They have three times the growth, why isn't the multiple any better? And the answer lies here at the cost of capital. Because if you have two companies that have the same spread, but if we use a different discount rate for those companies, then the multiples are gonna be different. So Costco's earnings are being discounted at 6.3%. Walmart's earnings are being discounted at 5%. So the third factor at work here is that Costco's discount rate is hurting its PE. Right, So the high growth spread is being offset by Costco's higher cost of equity. Because if Costco had the same cost of equity as Walmart, it would be trading at 71 times earnings. The stock price would more than double. right? But they don't because they're perceived to be more risky than Walmart, higher beta. So therefore, <clears throat> Costco's trading at a premium because of the higher growth and spread but it is mitigated by the higher cost of equity of 6.3% versus 5.5%. That's the other important insight if you were trying to explain these multiples. Does everybody see that? Questions about that? All right, so now let's talk about Costco versus Target. What's causing that difference in growth and spread? Okay, so in this case, Costco is trading at a premium to Target because number one, much higher growth rate, 3.8% versus 0.4. But what's interesting is Target actually has a higher spread than Costco, 26.1 minus 6.9. So let's just call that 19 points there of spread versus call this 15 points of spread. So Target has a higher spread, but a lower growth, which is hurting in the Costco, and a slightly higher cost of capital. 6.9% cost of equity versus 6.3% cost of equity. So for Target, we can say the real reason they're trading at a discount to Costco is because of the lack of growth at a higher spread. It's all about growth when I talked about Target and Costco, because the difference here in the cost of capital doesn't make as much. See, if they, Target had the same cost of capital as Costco, share price wouldn't change as much, right? So what's really driving, you can see it here, I made this 3.85. Right? 
What's really driving the differences of the multiples is primarily the lack of growth, and then the cost of capital starts to matter more, right? But regardless, that's what I'd have to try and explain when I did my analysis. Yeah, so somebody asked me a question here. They said in the chat box, you probably mentioned this already, but the actual PE ratios for the forward year one or a different forward year. Okay, so the actuals are forward year two. Okay, and again, so if I go to target, my screenshots here, EEO, we're using the second forward year, which is you can count actual forward year one, two. So it would be these years, this column this column okay because again the first forward year in bloomberg has a combination we're in again april 2020 so data through april 2020 is actual may 2020 through the reported year through uh to start or january 2021 is forecast so for, even for target i have a mix of actual and forecast in this column this forward year two, the convention is more normalized because it's a pure forecast of all 12 months. So we're using FY2 multiples in this class, okay, for this analysis. Other questions about this analysis, where the data is coming from, what we're using? Because we're reaching halftime here. This is the first set of ratios that you have to analyze, all right? Now <clears throat> we're going to go to the second tab. Somebody asked. So for ROE, this is the average of one, two, and three, or is just two and three and four? Um, I'm actually averaging one, two, and three. Okay. But asterisk. This for all three of these companies, which I'm just using the first three years and averaging, is representation of the future. Okay. And I'm just saying by looking at the three, it's a starting point for saying the three year average is representative of the future for these companies. If it's not, then I would have to use different numbers. And I'll give you an example. I did not choose certain companies for your assignment because I knew that this would be harder. I knew Costco, Walmart, and uh, Target were easier to understand because in the middle of the crisis and pre-crisis, their numbers don't look all that different. But let's say that I was looking at United Airlines, which again, saw their passenger volume drop by 96% or 97% May over May. Seriously, they're gonna lose 90% of their passengers will be traveling, not be traveling over the uh, year over year for May. Like, no one's flying anywhere right now. So here's the point. If you look at United's numbers, even today, and I try and look at their return on equities coming up, these return on equities, Negative 32%, then 24, then 18. I mean, it's, it's going to be an awful year for the airlines. So if I do a three-year average, I'm going to get a very bad number. In fact, I even could get, depending on how bad it goes in 2021, a three-year average could actually be negative for a company. So the point is, when I start doing PEs, that's not going to make any sense. So what I'd almost have to do is exclude this as an outlier and try and figure out PEs that's more representative of the future. So I might have to create what I'll call a synthetic ROE that says, what do I think the ROE is, of the future is going to be? So I didn't give you airlines. That would have made a much tougher assignment, but that's eventually, think about where you're gonna be in a couple of weeks with your group project, I might give you something like this. But for now, we're gonna say this is representative. That's why this wouldn't really be representative for an airline, but for a company like Costco, pre-post virus, they haven't changed all that much. So for Costco, it is somewhat similar. Pre and post for ROE. So it is more representative of their future. All right, so second set of ratios that you're gonna look at is gonna be the enterprise value multiples. Okay. So continuing on, let's go back to our content here. So, Again, we do enterprise value multiples. This, from the book, is the derivation for EV to EBIT. I'd actually shown you this slide about a month ago, 
we built into our valuation model the EV to EBIT tab and the assumptions to solve for G, okay? And this was the idea. If we took our EV to enterprise value multiple, how do we get to EV to EBIT? Key value driver equation. No plat is just EBIT times one minus the tax rate, right? Divide both sides by EBIT. EBIT cancels out. Enterprise value to EBIT is one minus tax rate times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. And oh, by the way, if I want to do an enterprise value to sales, which is the final multiple I'm going to have you held accountable for this semester, then we start with a key value driver equation. No plat is revenue times EBIT times one minus tax rate over revenue. So revenue times no plat margin over revenue to get the uh, equation there. Divide both sides by revenue, revenue cancels out. We get margin, EBIT margin, times one minus the tax rate, times one minus G over ROIC over WAC minus G. So this was the other formula that we'd already used, which says this, one minus the tax rate times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G is this. So essentially, this is the enterprise value to EBIT multiple. So enterprise value to revenue equals the EBIT margin times enterprise value to EBIT. In fact, that's why we took the enterprise value to revenue divided by enterprise value to EBIT, and you get your EBIT margin, okay? That's just math, <clears throat> okay? So here's the point. This is what we're about to do on this slide, okay? Is we're gonna analyze the EV to sales or EV to revenue ratio, and we're gonna analyze the EV to EBIT multiple, okay? For Costco, Walmart, and Target. We've already done this analysis in our tabs. We're just gonna play it out here, okay? So for Costco, we need a tax rate. Well, basically, because we had done the valuation, We had done a valuation for Costco here earlier this semester. Then the same value we use for Costco for assumptions for tax rate, or ratios for tax rate, 26%, is the same one we should use here. Same process. So either looking at a JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank analyst report to figure out the tax rate, or by looking at a company's earnings call but we need to figure out the tax rate. We'd already done that process for Costco, <clears throat> right? Now, we also need an operating ROIC that's representative of the long-term. One of the challenges with Bloomberg is it doesn't give us an ROIC forecast of the future, fortunately, unfortunately. It doesn't directly give us an, an EEO, <clears throat> sensitive keyboard, doesn't give us a forecast for ROIC. It does give it for ROE, but not ROIC. So here's the thing. When we did the valuation of Costco, as of the as is, we have in our model a continuing value ROIC for Costco. That basically was part of our as is valuation that got it to match. That was 25.1%. So 25.1% is the perpetuity number. And today's WAC for Costco, it's not the cost of equity, but it's the WAC is 6%. So 6%. And today, same thing off of the EEO screen, The enterprise value to sales multiple is 0.8, we're trading at 0.8 times sales or revenue. And the enterprise value to EBIT multiple to second forward year today is 24.36. So if I solve for growth, probably around 3%, or Um, 
הייתה... That would be my G. Okay. And again, that's a similar process that we already did in our models. Okay. I'm just going to do it two more times. I'm going to do it for Walmart, and I'm going to do it for Target. So for Walmart, again, we had done evaluation in our class for Walmart. In our as-is valuation for Walmart that we did back at April 6th, we had gotten a tax rate of 24.4%. 24.4%. And we had guessed that the expected ROIC long-term in perpetuity was around 11.5%. And today, the WAC for Walmart, it's gonna use today's, not the one from April 6th, is 4.2% WAC, as opposed to 5% cost of equity, 4.2. And today, Walmart is trading at EV to revenue, EV to sales, 0.8, second forward year. Same as Costco, trading 80 cents. And EV to EBIT, they are trading at second forward year, 19.27 times EBIT. Which suggests a G, which we solve for, of around 1%. There we go, something like point four two percent. And for Target, very quickly, Target's WAC, 5.6% today. Just one on the screen, EEO. They're trading at 80 cents EV to revenue as well. Interesting, Walmart, Target, and Costco all trading 80 cents today. And their EV to EBIT is 13.22. When we did the valuation of Target in this class, for homework seven in our as is, we had come up with a tax rate, 23, that's what we'd used. So we should say tax rate. And for ROIC in the as is, we said the perpetuity ROIC was 14. And that's the as is at the time. So for their growth rate, it's probably gonna be slightly negative, 0 0.002, something like that. Something like that. All right, so now that we have the data filled in, we have to do the final analysis. Why is Costco trading at a premium or discount. Now they're trading at a premium to both Walmart and Target. So again, using the key value drivers, these numbers, why? We'll start at Costco versus Walmart. So Costco is trading at a premium, 24.4 versus 19.3 <clears throat> times EBIT to Walmart. And the reason why is even though they have a slightly higher tax rate of 26 versus 24.4, which should not explain the difference, okay? It's all about the growth, 
3.4 versus 0.42. And the much higher spread, 25.1 versus minus 6 is 15 points. Sorry, is uh, 19 points versus about 7 points of spread here. So the much higher growth at the much higher spread is why they're trading at a higher multiple. However, <clears throat> that multiple is somewhat being suppressed by the whack of 6% versus the 4.2% whack. Because like I said, if Costco had Walmart's whack, their share price would be three times higher. But because Costco doesn't have Walmart's whack, their share price is a little bit higher. Okay, multiples 24 versus 19. So the higher WAC, six versus four, and the slightly higher tax rate, again, the 24-4 doesn't make nearly as much of a difference. But generally, it's the high growth, high spread, 3.4 versus 0.42 at a 19-point spread is the primary reason for the, the difference at the premium, but it's offset by the 50% higher cost of capital. Does everybody see how I'm drawing those conclusions, making those assumptions? Because that's what you'd have to be writing up. Costco is trading at a premium to target. 24.4 versus 13, almost double. Why? Well, what's interesting is, again, target has a spread much more similar to Walmart's. Their spread is nine points. Costco's spread is 19 points, right? What's making the difference here? <clears throat> well, what's making the difference here is all growth. Growth of 3.3 versus the negative 0.4. So it's the growth at the much higher spread that is giving them a much higher multiple 20.4 over 13.2, okay? But again, slightly higher cost of capital, but notice, if I make this 5.6, this doesn't have as much of a dampening effect as the difference between Costco and Walmart. But nonetheless, the higher whack at Costco does diminish how high the multiple could be because it would be another four, time, four points higher if they had a similar whack as Target. So again, it's difference in growth at the much higher spread offset by the slightly higher WAC and the slightly higher tax rate. That's why Costco is trading at a premium to target on EV to EBIT. Questions about those assumptions, how I made them, or what was being said, because I'm throwing a lot of data at you. All right, finally, you have to explain the EV to sales multiple. Why are they all at 80 cents? So let's go back to, this is the Walmart valuation. And this is the ROIC drivers template. And we know as we've walked through the ROIC drivers that ROIC is a function of margin, productivity, and tax rate. So here's how this works. This is the ROIC. This is the operating margin. And the reason we know this is the operating margin is because EV to sales divided by EV to EBIT is operating margin, EBIT margin. And at this tax rate, that EBIT margin becomes that no plat margin. And that no plat margin times my productivity, one over the productivity, is my ROIC. So margin, productivity, ROIC, those are related. This was just completing this tree, okay? The only difference here is that this includes both this and this. So back to here, why are they trading at 80 cents? Why am I spending the same amount of value for every dollar of sales when Costco <clears throat> makes less in every sale than Walmart. And the reason why is because even though they're making 3.3 cents for every dollar of profit, and they're making four cents for every dollar of profit, the reason why their sales are the same is number one, Costco uses one third 
of the capital to sell the same amount of products. So their ROIC is much higher, almost double Walmart's. So that makes those sales much more valuable. However, higher ROIC at a much higher WAC, six versus four, is why the enterprise value to sales multiple starts to equalize. So Costco has an advantage on productivity, which turns our lower margin product into a higher return. But the return isn't as valuable because I'm discounting it more and net net, they're both trading 80 cents to sales. Now Target has the highest margin, almost double Costco's, but same thing. One third the productivity and slightly lower cost to capital, okay? But nonetheless, 80 cents in sales. So what really is helping Costco is not their margin. What, what people are really <clears throat> paying a lot for EV to sales is their productivity. Their productivity is a great equalizer because they're selling this with a lot less investment. By the way, here's the other reason why this number is important. So the multiples infer a productivity number. If you remember, when we did our Walmart valuation, or Costco valuations, Costco, <clears throat> one of the assumptions I said was look at the ratios. What should the productivity be? And I said, well, probably around 10 cents. Well, this point one is that point one. So the ratios are reinforcing that the market is using this productivity long term. And that would have been one of the things we would have added back to our valuation. This were the normal for full semester class. But in a way, the other thing about the ratios is it helps us infer the productivity of a company because it's built into the ratios that are in the marketplace today, if you know how to look. So as I said, what we're covering today is advanced. This is advanced ratio analysis, and this is not being done by most people in the real world. But if you really wanna understand what's going on, by understanding the academic formulas, you now have a much better idea about why companies are trading in a premium or discount. So for your homework assignment, this is what you're gonna do. Same process, filling out this spreadsheet for the data for instead of Costco, Walmart, and Target, it's gonna be Starbucks, McDonald's, and Yum Brands. And Yum is, again, Taco Bell, KFC, and Pizza Hut, okay? So basically, you're gonna explain premiums or discounts. Now, the one thing <clears throat> process-wise that you're gonna struggle with is ROIC, okay? Because basically, you don't wanna do a full, and I didn't give you the data to do a full valuation to get to this ROIC. Okay. That would be ideal, but it would take a lot more work. So here's the shortcut, proxy. Mm -hmm. So the proxy is this. If we go back to Bloomberg, and I go to, I'll use uh, Starbucks as an example. This is your homework. And we go to RV. <clears throat> And we go to custom. Custom. And we look at our spread template from earlier in the semester. Sitting in our spread template is a calculated operating ROIC. We can use this as a proxy for the ROICs in our multiple model, okay? Now, it's not ideal, that'll be for these ROICs here, okay? It's not ideal, but let me give you an example of this. If I were to switch this to Costco, then the Costco ROIC here calculating our Bloomberg template for 2000 and last fiscal year, 2019, is 22%. And in our model, we had estimated our valuation 25. For Walmart, last year, Walmart operating ROIC was 10.3, and we had estimated 11.5. 
in our model. Last year, uh, target was 13.5. We had estimated 14 in our model. So the point is, past doesn't guarantee future, but if the past is representative of the future, then you can use that as a proxy. So for Starbucks, <clears throat> for Pizza Hut, well, Yum Brands, and for McDonald's, they probably have not seen as much of a drop off. And so the past is probably somewhat representative of their future, right? If, however, the past were not representative of the future, you'd have to come up with a more representative number. But for purposes of this assignment, for homework eight, you can use this as your operating ROIC so you don't have to do the full valuations. So that's what's due Wednesday, 10 a.m. The 500 word write up that you're doing is basically doing the, the analysis of the PE drivers and the EV to EBIT drivers. Uh, you have to fill out the spreadsheet individually, write up the explanation, submit that, and then we'll discuss this in class on Wednesday. The data to do the assignment is posted online. Assignments, homework eight. And I've recorded this class as a video, so the video should be up shortly. Any questions? All right, we'll look forward to seeing everybody in two days. Thank you. Stay safe, see everybody on Wednesday. Bye. -bye.